complet op het kader en de close reading, de tekstanalyse. Dan valt er veel te lachen nog voor het slapen gaan. John Daniel. Oh ja, yeah, I says in my best northern Minnesota and fourth generation Swedish farmer accent. I remember Spandau Ballet. Me and my friend Jerome, you know, we used to laugh about how they'd made what was the worst song not only of 1983, but of the entire decade. Sure, Spandau Ballet. How could you forget them? They were like Roxy Music for the empty-headed teenage crowd with all the sound and none of the craft. Their singer was David Bowie without a game plan. Total genius. Cotton candy so pure you couldn't make it to the end of the first bite. About 12 years after the last time anybody had mentioned Spandau Ballet except as the answer to a trivia question, I found myself in Dublin hanging out with Robert and John Parkinson on the day when they ran across a 12-inch single of Gold, the band's follow-up to their worldwide number one single, True. Following an obsession in which I was shortly to become involved, Robert bought the record and we all went back to their house. Once there, the shining vinyl disc, which looked as though it had either been greatly revered or completely ignored, was placed on the turntable with a sense of ceremony and we all sat near the speakers listening. I remembered that I'd bought Gold back when it came out in the hopes of hearing something even more unbearable than true. Back then I hadn't known quite what to make of it. I knew now, though, it was good. It made me wonder if I hadn't missed whole schools of good music because their public presentations had been all wrong. And I still wonder about that sometimes. Musical moves that had seemed like some very nasty schmaltz in 1983 sounded, in 1996, like huge, gaudily passionate gestures, bravely standing up and bracing themselves in preparation for the waves of ridicule about to crash against them. I didn't exactly make it my mission in life to get to the bottom of the Spandau Ballet question, but I did give them their own folder in the fat and getting fatter all the time to be investigated file that eats up potentially useful bandwidth in my brain. Slowly but surely, I began to get a beat on Spandau Ballet. A couple of years later, in a record store in St. Louis, I finally broke down and bought True, the album which had given Spandau Ballet their only real taste of American success. I bought a used vinyl copy in great condition. It only cost me $2.99. If you'd have told me in 1983 that I'd someday be gearing up to publicly announce that my investment in True was one of the soundest I'd ever made, I'd have called you insane, but I'm beginning to come around to the opinion that the whole purpose of living is to work such, such miracles of contrast. True was a real revelation. Listening to it, working out its frame of reference and figuring out what drove it into existence was no less exciting than learning that Eat a Peach by the Allman Brothers isn't just a cultural artifact, but one of the greatest albums of all time. Before you think that I've finally gone permanently off the deep end, let me say that True is by no means a, as good an album as Eat a Peach. The stakes in the former case are nowhere near as high as they are in the latter, and the values are too disparate. The Allman Brothers, whatever their sins against fashion, were artists then in direct communion with the high muses, and Eat a Peach is a record explicitly about death. True, by contrast, is an almost purely aesthetic exercise. I don't pretend that it can hope to play with the big boys for too long, though that will come later. What I do want to say is, first, that True inhabits a space which is, if not unique to itself in the entire history of music, at least quite elite. Despite its proven ability to fit in, it sold very well in the U.S. and incredibly well abroad, it really had nothing to do with the audience that received it. And this is borne out by the album that followed it, which will, if you'll only give me a little leeway, eventually be the point of all this. What I wanted to know in 1983, and what I'm still trying to figure out today, is what kind of a love song exactly has words like these. So true. Funny how it seems. Always in time, but never in line for dreams. Head over heels, when toe to toe, this is the sound of my soul. I bought a ticket to the world, but now I've come back again. Why do I find it hard to write the next line when I want the truth to be said? I know this much is true. As I am so often compelled to ask, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> I challenge, no, I dare anyone to make any sense of the lyrics I quoted. What to speak of construing them as the lyrics to a love song. There is no feeling of any kind mentioned, though a sort of detached amusement is invoked in the phrase, funny how it seems. 
If we are to take the first two lines as a lead into the third, we might be getting somewhere. But unfortunately for everyone concerned, the third line is always in time but never in line for dreams, which in its total refusal to yield to even the closest reading is a master stroke of code speak. The Latinate sentence structure is cute, making two clauses depend on the same object, dreams, while using only one preposition, for, but the sense of it is forever buried. Nor is it the case that all will be explained later. Once passed, the line is never revisited. Radical subjectivists may find some sense to cling to, but without a subject, am I always in time? Are we in general always in time, but never in line? Is this supposed to be taken as an attack, or a complaint, or a disinterested observation? then there really is nothing for us to grab at. Those of you who are skeptical of close readings when the whole text hasn't been presented to you are urged to continue through to the song's conclusion. Quote, With a thrill in my head and a pill on my tongue, dissolve the nerves that have just begun, listening to Marvin all night long. This is the sound of my soul. Always slipping from my hands, and I gotta say this is my favorite, sands a time of its own. Take your seaside arms and write the next line. I want the truth to be known. I don't know about you, but the ultimate and total victory of emptiness over substance in the lines above sends chills up and down my spine. There is literally nothing there. You are quite welcome to write your own scenario within which the lyrics to true might take place, but the song itself would not offer you an oar if you were drowning at sea. It is a love song. Sure, it sounds enough like one for me to give you that, but the object of its affection is a void so endless and so profound that it is a wonder to me that the project made it through the multiple hurdles that must be passed before a song gets released as a single. Lest the reader be mistaken, I am in no way criticizing lyricist Gary Kemp for failing to invest his words with meaning. To the contrary, I am praising him for stripping them of it. It is no mean trick, and it gives me perverse delight to report to you that the whole album is like this. I hope you're sitting down, though some of you know me well enough by now to see this coming. The follow-up to True, Parade, is a freaking masterpiece, as monolithic in its success at what it does as physical graffiti or rocks. If I remember correctly, Parade came and went, you'll forgive the obvious conceit, with all the fanfare of a janitor's arrival. Stateside, at least, I think I was pretty much the only person who noticed that the follow-up to True had been recorded, packaged, and released. In a very brief period of time, the people who'd been pushing Spandau Ballet had either moved on to other things or dropped off the map completely, and so, predictably, had Spandau Ballet. Such evidence as I have suggests that their expiration date came a little later across the pond, but here at Last Plane to Jakarta, we are only interested in what's happening on and around the runway. Parade's lone U.S. single, Only When You Leave, skipped like a small stone halfway across a narrow stream and sank to the bottom, somewhere near the middle. To the best of my knowledge, I am one of the only people who remembers it. Like all Spandau Ballet songs, it is quite bizarre to state the case mildly. It leads off the Parade album in a mood similar to that of True, but quite a good deal richer. It is a spiced rum truffle to True's Mr. Goodbar. One can tell immediately that Gary Kemp thought he'd stumbled onto, if not a gold mine, then at least a bank vault, and that he meant to stick around a while publicly courting his muse. The rich textures of True are fleshed out a little more here, and the saxophone is more lush, more languid than it had been before, and the air that a band gives off once they've cleared the hurdle of the top ten is everywhere. Their confidence is as thick as musk. Perhaps this is why the fairly simple, if ultimately impenetrable, platitudes of True have given way to this. And I quote, Only when you leave, I'll need to love you. And when the action has all gone, I'm just a little fool enough to need you, fool enough too long. Only when you leave, you'll leave in danger. Oh, I'll make sure that you pay. So give a little passion to a stranger and take this soul away. It may be that Gary Kemp imagined an audience filled with listeners who had surmounted the gap between author and reader and who were therefore able to read his mind. It may be. Or it may be that he was conducting an experiment in secrecy. Either way, there is no indication anywhere in the song as to what exactly the departing lover will pay for or with, 
nor can even the keenest critical mind determine what is meant by give a little passion to a stranger, to say nothing of take this soul away. Clearly the spurned lover is angry, but further than that lies uncharted water. Our only hope would have lay in true had, it, had we been able to get to the bottom of that one, but it will be recalled that we were most decidedly not. There is no making heads or tails of any of this. Repeat adventures into parade only increase the distance between itself and the listener, which is a pretty neat trick. Generally speaking, if I study a thing long enough, sooner or later it's going to have to open up and reveal its secrets. Parade, however, is a long series of false doors and blind alleys, a sort of aesthetic Winchester house beckoning from the glitzy heart of the 80s. It makes good on the promise of gold insofar as any stories that one might, might try to find hiding in the lyrics wind up getting holes punched in them almost as soon as they're told. To contend that the lyrics are merely badly written is to overlook the stunning fact that they accomplish the same feat, turning something into nothing again and again by means of an elusive, transparent effect that leaves the listener feeling as though the mood in which he comes away from the songs, which is usually a vague sadness with hints of indignation or shame, were somehow rooted somewhere, when the evidence strongly suggests that there is no place within reason for these songs to take root. Consequently, one is forced to revisit the songs endlessly since the mind will not accept what it finds or fails to find in them. By the time one reaches With the Pride, the penultimate song on the album's second side, lyrics like, Just leave me with the pride that I worked for, now they've taken the reason away. Just leave me with the pride that I worked for today. Slide into the listener almost completely unnoticed like nettles or odorless gas. It is so exactly like dreaming that to say anything more about it is perhaps the most vain exercise in which I have ever engaged. Oh yeah, I says, shivering a little and drawing my coat around myself, wishing for a second that I hadn't given up smoking. I remember Spandau Ballet. They all wore tuxedos. They were awesome.